Okay, I think I'm the next one to welcome you. We're still early, so I can still do that. But, of course, also from my side, a very warm thank you to Benjamin and Jana. Um, they were actually mostly kind when describing my role in organizing this. I basically just launched the idea and had them do all the work, right? Let's be clear about that. I didn't do that much. So all the thank you should go to these guys for, for doing a wonderful job in bringing together w w something that we should call, a, I think, a discourse theory community by now. So welcome all, also from my side. I'll uh, have a quick talk about, I think, one of the, the key challenges that uh, discourse theory uh, has to sort of come to terms with and has to deal with, which is the, the relationship between the discursive and uh, the material. What I've tried to do in this area, in this field, is to uh, contribute to what I would like to call the development of a theory of entanglement. And somehow, I don't know why, don't ask me, I sort of came up with this knot idea, and I didn't use the word entanglement, but I started thinking and writing about the knot as a metaphor, uh, not as something that can ever be untied, let that be clear, but as a way of thinking through the materiality of um, the discursive and the discursive nature of the material. Now, what's behind all this, and of, of course you'll have to sit through at least two narcissistic slides, I do sort of beg your forgiveness for that. Uh, what, um, I think that this discussion on the relationship of the discursive and the material can offer us is also a way of strengthening discourse theory itself. And that's, I think, the first argument that I would like to make, is sort of looking for strategies of enriching discourse theory while still remaining uh, with at least one foot and probably, and preferably more, within the discursive theoretical tradition. And I warned you about narcissism, so uh, in case you're interested, in case you want to read more, there's some open access stuff down there. Having said that, we can now go to business. My story will have two parts. First is this uh, theoretical elaboration on the discursive material knot. I'll take you there. <coughs> the argument, again, is that we need to, from a discourse theoretical perspective, have a closer look at the material and see how it can actually relate to the discursive in more respectful ways, and I'll come back to that. The second part of my story is that, uh, and that applies to discourse theory, but also towards this discursive material entanglement, is that we need to do more, I would argue, to rethink other theoretical fields, reclaim other theoretical fields in trying to re-articulate them so that they are also closer to our field of discourse theory. So that will be the second part. One of the luxuries of starting uh, a talk on discourse theory with a crowd that knows discourse theory, is that I don't have to explain this. This is such a wonderful moment for me, because I always spend time looking at people in the audience that have this huge frown on their face, suffering that they have to go through another elaboration of discourse theory. Not really understanding what I'm talking about, while well, still me doing my best to communicate some of the basic principles. So I won't. I'll skip this one. What I do want to talk about a bit more is that discourse theory in its reception, of course, has been confronted with the critique of idealism. And if you start looking at some of the voices that are a bit less sympathetic towards discourse theory, the word, the concept, the signifier of idealism always pops up. And even if we could easily say, well, this, this might not be true, this is not a fair critique, this is not an idealist model, that critique continues to haunt us. And we can defend us, we can say like, and of course the acknowledgement has been uh, formulated even in, in HSS, uh, we can simply say, but this is a materialist theory. We are interested in materialism. Take a look at the earthquake example. Now, I don't know how you think about Laclau and Mouffe's work and their capacity to illustrate, but I honestly think that the earthquake example is the only good example they ever produced. But it's a good one, because it brings out the basic notion 
of materiality, and it is part of the defense against the idealism critique. And there are other traces in discourse theory that bring out the material. I think if you look at the performative dimension, that's very much part of Ernesto Laclaise and Chantamus' work, if you think about uh, heterogeneity, but mostly, I would argue, if you think about the dislocation. The dislocation is one of these key theoretical concepts that actually contains a trace of the material, where the material can disrupt a discourse uh, through its confrontation with the real, so to speak. But still, my argument would be, could we have a bit more emphasis on the material? Because what we actually often do is pay lip service to the idea that the material matters. And then we all forget about it, and we start analyzing discourses. So maybe there is a bit of theoretical work, but maybe there is also a bit of more attention needed towards uh, the material. I came across this problem when I was working in Cyprus, and when I decided to at least try to understand the Cyprus problem better through looking at the memorials of different eras. This is a memorial from the Independence War from 1955-1959. Uh, it's an Aoka fighter opening the gates of freedom. Uh, and I started looking at these statues as ways of understanding uh, the, the Cyprus problems with all its wonderful complexities. Remember what Caroline said this morning about complexities. We do like to get our feet wet and trying to understand complexities. But I also started to think about the statues themselves and the materiality of these statues. It wasn't a coincidence, for instance, that all the statues in Cyprus that are commemorating the Cyprus problems have weapons. And that materiality is key to understanding the representations of the Cyprus problem. But the argument would also be that the material has something material that also plays a key role in understanding and communicating the Cyprus problem. So then I turned to some friends. Uh, and of course there are many options there and there are many other traditions. There is also something which we could jokingly call old materialism. I think that's Marxism, right? But new materialism is a field in, uh, in development that is actually highly promising in, on the one hand, offering theoretical reflections about the material, and on the other hand, I would argue, making exactly the same mistake as we are, but the inverse one, paying lip service to the importance of what they would often call the representational, and then not doing anything with it, focusing on the material. That's a very interesting inverse structure that we find in these two domains, I would argue. And if we start looking at new materialism, the notion of essential matter uh, is absolutely crucial, but we also do find quite a lot of respect in new materialist publications in dealing with the representational, dealing with the discursive, which is what some of the quotes. Uh, they're also desperately trying to avoid creating new dualisms even if they could do a bit more in thinking through the discursive and thinking through the logics of entanglement itself. So this is my romantic slide. <laughs> because this is what I propose. Now, I have the horror version of this romantic slide, which is this one. But I'll, <laughs> I'll come to that in a second. But the basic idea is that if we want to think through the relationships of the discursive and the material, we should avoid creating hierarchies. We should avoid privileging one over the other implicitly or explicitly. And this non-hierarchical model is a way of thinking through um, the relationships between the discursive and the material, which leads me to this impossible representation of these relationships. Now, this is meant to be incomprehensible. It's always nice if you're into visual logics, right? And present something that you're not supposed to understand. But it is to show the complexity of these relationships. And a lot of things that I've been working with are unpacking these different relationships, looking at every arrow, and looking in particular at, of course, the relationship between the discussion and the material with the support of a structure and agency dimension, which actually for me worked really well in trying to understand these relationships between the discursive and the material. What brings me to a, a non-hierarchical discursive material not model, that's a theory of entanglement, where we have to, on the one hand, of course, remain firmly grounded in a discourse theoretical position that respects the discursive, that generates 
the, the different meanings that we use, the frameworks of intelligibility that are so crucial to our worlds. But at the same time, we do have to acknowledge that the material has its own agency, has its own logics. And there the argument will be that we can look at two dimensions. Yes, there is the dislocation, right? the disruptive force where the real actually intervenes in particular discursive articulations and disrupts or destroys them. But I don't know if you've noticed, but that's actually a very negative version. And maybe we can have also something, you can do this very slowly, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> But it's a very negative version, and we can also have a much more positive version where the material invites for particular articulations, particular discursive articulations. And I think these dynamics of dislocation and uh, invitation are crucial. Quickly, let me go to the second point. We can use these reflections, these reflections, these theories of entanglement, and there are many other versions possible than discursive material. No. We can use the combination of the discursive and the material to also start rereading other theoretical frameworks, bringing them closer, also making them more easy to use for empirical analysis that is driven by discursive material theoretical formations. Because one of the problems in empirical research is that we often get confronted with theories that are external to discourse theory, for instance, and that don't provide a very clear match in dealing with the social realities that we actually want to research. So we need to bring in these theories through what I would argue for rereading practices of theoretical formations external to uh, discursive and material theories. And let me give you one example, because if we start looking at, for instance, participation and participatory theory, we can actually contribute from a discourse uh, material perspective to the development of participatory theory. And a number of people have been trying to do that, and Steyer and Ingerslev, uh, Danish authors, have been talking about participation as a multidimensional process, as an assemblage, which I think is extremely fruitful, also from the perspective of discourse theory, new materialism, but also participatory theory. And there's a quick analytical disclaimer. Of course, if we start thinking and talking, communicating about the discursive and the material, we have a tendency of splitting them. And I do the same. I find it from analytical, communicative perspectives, the easiest way to do. But there has to be an immediate disclaimer, because if I am arguing about a theory of entanglement, <coughs> then obviously I should talk about them at the same time, which I can't, because my mouth can only capture a word at a time. I use actually other techniques for that, more artistic techniques or more sound art to actually superimpose different layers of analysis, but I can't do that here. So participation in the discursive is chapter one, participation in the material is chapter two, but you have to hear them at the same time. Right? Bear with me. If we look at the discursive logics of participation, what we often find is a whole range of discourses that strengthen participation and that give meaning to the notion, the signifier of participation. Democratic discourses are key, but we'll also find discourses on social justice, discourses on human rights that allocate meaning to the signifier of participation. That's an easy one. The more interesting one is that we also have, yeah, well, I just said that, uh, sorry. The more interesting one is the one you find at the bottom. There are also a series of subject positions that structure the participatory process. And I would argue that we have two clusters of subject positions there. On the one hand, subject positions that deal with levels of empoweredness, and others that deal with levels of privilege. And the subject position of, for instance, the leader is key in understanding participatory processes, how the leader is articulated. Remember Kurt Lewin, right? Social psychology from the 1950s whether leadership is articulated as authoritarian leadership or democratic leadership, makes a huge difference also in organizing participatory processes. Because if you have an authoritarian leader, then there is hardly any space for any participatory process to begin with. So these subject positions play key roles in understanding. And there's hardly any work on that in participatory theory. And so this is where we can contribute. Participation in the material has been developed, work, for instance, 
by, by Norti Mares on material participation. It's that dark gray blob you see in the corner, right? That's shown, that's uh, her book. And of course, she is also quite respectful, arguing we need to look at the representation or we need to look uh, at the material at the same time. So it's again <laughs> these logics of entanglement. But what we can start thinking about in these participatory processes is, for instance, taking community media as an example, we need to think about giving people access to technologies as part of a participatory process. The materiality of handling a microphone in a community radio station is key to understanding what participation is. But also what to go to good old Saint-Simon to think about the administration of things, how we decide and how we manage things as part of a participatory process is equally important. Now, of course, these are entangled, they're combined, and they should be seen as <coughs> reinforcing each other, or in possible cases, contradicting and uh, even disrupting each other. Jason told me I should be quiet soon, so I will go to my conclusion, if you don't terribly mind. So the points I wanted to raise is that we can use these discursive material entanglements to look at different theoretical frameworks that are outside uh, our, maybe our comfort zone in some cases, but outside discourse theory and new materialism. And the participatory assemblage is one example. We can enrich these theoretical fields by looking at their discursive and material dimensions. But I think we can also enrich discourse theory itself by bringing in a stronger emphasis on the material, res respecting the materiality of the material, so to speak. But never forgetting, I would argue, one of the backbones of discourse theory, and that is the contingency of both the material and the discursive. Thank you.